In this series of videos, we're going to talk about first order predicate logic. In this video, we'll start with some examples and then give a very concise overview of the syntax of logical formulas. There are several different kinds of logic. Here, we're going to be talking about first order predicate logic. Sometimes that's called predicate calculus or first order, order predicate calculus or simply predicate logic. There are also other kinds of logic. Propositional logic is simpler and higher order logics are more complex. Uh, when people say just formal logic, it's assumed that they mean first order predicate logic. So we'll begin with an example statement in predicate logic. Let me just read this. This is the for all symbol. This upside down A is, means for all and this backwards E means there exists. So for all Q, Q is a variable, P is a variable, X and Y are variables. It's saying for all Q there exists a P such that for all X, Y the following is true. And this says P is greater than Q and X and Y are both greater than 1. And together those things imply X times Y does not equal P. So let's, this is saying in short formally that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So looking at it again for every number you give me, every Q, I, there exists a P that's larger. So for any number you can think of, there's always a larger number P that's a prime. And what is a prime? Well, first of all, we're saying that P is larger than Q and it means that for every pair X and Y, X times Y does not equal P as long as X and Y are both greater than 1. So this is a formal logical statement of the theorem that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So we see the key aspects of predicate logic here. We see the quantifiers for all and there exists and we see the logical connectives such as and this upside down V is used for and and the implies symbol which is oftentimes shown as a double arrow. So let's look at another example. This is a statement of Fermat's last theorem and to remind you what that is it says that um, the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no integer solutions for n greater than 2. So what we're saying is for all variables a, b, c, and n, if a, b, and c are greater than 0 and n is greater than 2, it implies that a to the n plus b to the n does not equal c to the n. So there's, n there does not exist an n which will make this true. And let's do one more example here. This is the twin prime conjecture and this, the theorem is that there are infinitely many prime pairs. A prime pair is a pair of numbers that are separated by one. In other words, so for example 29 and 31 are separated by the number 30 and both 29 and 31 are primes. So this is a prime pair. And again it has this the same general form. For every number Q there exists a larger number P. P is greater than Q. Such that for all X's and Y's if X and Y are greater than 1 then P is a prime meaning X and Y don't equal P and X and Y don't equal P plus 2. In other words there is no pair XY that will equal either P or P plus 2. So this is a statement of the twin prime conjecture. By the way, these statements are have different um, truth values, I guess you want, might say, or different proofs. Uh, this has been known to be true since ancient times. Um, Fermat's last theorem was an unproved theorem for many years, but in the last few years a mathematician has proven this. And 
The last one, the twin prime conjecture, uh, seems to be true and is, has been tested by computer up to very, very large numbers, but it is still unproven. So there's no proof that there are infinitely many. So in talking about logic, we've seen examples of three different formulas. And here's a, another formula. For all x, there exists a y such that uh, x is greater than y implies lex, uh, y is less than x. It doesn't really matter what it means at this point. This is just an example of a formula. Formulas have certain syntax. For example, uh, the for all sign has to be followed by a variable and brackets have to match and, and so on. So these are just simple strings. Formulas are strings, but these strings follow a certain syntax. And later we'll discuss the exact syntax of legal formulas. In addition, we have this idea that there's a universe somewhere. So this is a statement about numbers, as were the previous three statements. This, the previous three, three formulas were about integers, and, and so there's a, a universe of objects that we can talk about. And these objects are related. For example, 4 is less than 7. So there are relations between these objects in the universe of, dis, of discourse. And these symbols that we're using, such as greater than and less than, refer to those relationships within the universe. So we've got a, a, a syntactic string here of symbols, and we need to make a connection between that and the objects of the universe and the relations in, between objects in the universe. And when we make that connection, we have a model for the formula. So a model is a connection or an association between symbols in the formula and the objects and the relations in the universe. Without the universe and without a connection between these symbols and objects and relations in the universe, this is nothing more than a, a string of symbols with no meaning. And so we want to separate the idea that the formula is a sequence of symbols. And yes, it has a certain syntax, but it also has a certain meaning. And so those two things we want to make clear that they are not the same thing. A formula can be syntactically correct, but without the universe and the connection to the relations, it has no meaning. But given that there is a universe, and we do have some model for the formula, then we can ask, is the formula true or not? So there are two questions to ask. The first is whether it's syntactically proper, whether it's a valid formula that might be true or false. I mean, after all, the sequence of symbols could be pure gibberish. But assuming that it's syntactically correct, the second question we can ask is whether the formula is true, given the model for the formula. Some formulas turn out to be true. Some turn out to be false. And some turn out to be true sometimes and false other times, depending on uh, which model you choose. Now, the question we want to ask is, how can we prove that a true formula is really true? We like to use logic in math and in perhaps other areas, and we'd like to have proofs that are rigorous and, and mathematically correct and formally defined. So how can we prove that particular formulas are true or not? And the answers um, the answer is that we can provide proofs. And a proof has essentially uh, some steps in it. We start from things that we know are true or that we assume are true, and these are called our axioms. So axioms are, are things that we are assuming are true without having to prove. And then using some sort of rules of inference or rules of logical deduction, we go from things we know to be true to things that we have then proven are true. And so we do this naturally when we provide a mathematical proof, but in the area of logic we do it more formally and more precisely, and our rules of inference are uh, rigorously defined. And since they're rigorously defined, we uh, try to, we would like to automate the process. Okay? Uh, some formulas are true, so we can immediately ask about the set of true formulas. Given a particular formula, we can ask, is that formula true or not? So we'd like to be able to identify which formulas belong to the set of true formulas, that is, 
we'd like to be able to answer the question, is this given formula a true formula or not? Well, remember when we have problems like this, we turn them into languages. And uh, so we can talk about the set of true formulas. And then our uh, computability question becomes, um, is that set of true formulas a decidable set? Is this a decidable problem? In other words, can we find a computable function that will determine whether a formula is true or not? Before we go any further, let's be a little bit more precise about the syntax of formulas. So we want to specify what is a syntactically correct formula before we can begin to ask whether that formula is true or not, given a particular model. So formulas are strings of symbols, and those symbols come from an alphabet. So our alphabet will include the two quantifiers, for all, and there exists. We'll use parentheses. We'll use logical symbols for and, or, implies, and not, the, the logical operations. We'll also have variables, and we'll have relation symbols. So just to repeat, we use this upside down V for and. It's always easy to remember that this one's and and this one's or because this one looks sort of like an A, and and starts with an A. This is our symbol for or. Sometimes we say uh, that we use the word conjunction for and. A conjunction is a, a group of things that are anded together or conjoined. And we use the word disjunction for or. Um, typically, this symbol is the not symbol. And we use that for negation. And we use an arrow, oftentimes a double arrow, for implication. Okay, X implies Y or P implies Q. As I mentioned, the upside down A stands for for all, A for all. And the backwards E stands for there exists. We call this one the universal quantifier, and this one is called the existential quantifier. And uh, I'm not telling you what these symbols mean because we're just working on the syntax of formulas. So just this is what they mean over here in black, but for now they're just symbols. And uh, they can't have meaning until we describe how what the meaning is relative to. Uh, we also assume that we can use variables. Typically in our formulas we use variables like x, y, z, or maybe other names that are more meaningful. But we'll just assume that there's an infinite supply of variable names. And if you prefer, you can just call them x1, x2, x3, and so on. You know, if you want to get very precise and technical, our alphabet just needs to have only one symbol for variables. And then to achieve the effect of different variables, we can just repeat the symbol. So the variable x is different from the variable xx, which is different from the variable xxx. It's much clearer to use human-readable symbols for variables, and we'll assume that we can tell the difference between symbol variables and other sorts of symbols, and that we have an infinite supply of variable names. Finally, we have symbols for relations. Um, in the most austere version, we just use symbols R1, R2, R3, and so on. Depending on how many relations we want to put into our formula, we uh, can add that many uh, symbols to our alphabet. But we would like to have our formulas uh, be more human readable. If we use just symbols R2 and R3 and variable names like X2, X3, or God forbid, XX, XXX, in order to make, then we'll have a formula that's almost completely unreadable. Uh, instead, we prefer to use symbols um, that are related to the model. So, for example, if we're talking about a universe of numbers and relations like addition and subtraction, we would prefer to use the traditional symbols for plus and minus. And so we might see syntax like this in our formulas. But this is really shorthand for a more precise and formal syntax where you use the relation symbols, and each relation symbol has a number of variables or a number of uh, an, an arity. In this case, the symbol R2 apparently takes three, 
arguments. So when we use the more natural symbols, it makes the connection between the relation symbols and the relations in the universe explicit and transparent. So in the examples I gave before, we saw symbols for plus and times and equals and so on. And this makes our formulas easier to read. But in a more austere formal version, we would only use relation symbols R and variables X. Now, each relation symbol has an arity. This one has an arity of three, meaning it takes three arguments. So, in order for it to be used syntactically correctly, it has to be followed, the relation symbol has to be followed with a parenthesis and um, three things separated by commas and a closing parenthesis. So, each relation symbol has a given arity and it has to be used correctly with the proper number of arguments. If we see something like this, where the arity is not correct, here we only have one argument when we should have three, or if we see something like this, where it's just a complete mess, then these are not syntactically correct. And as I said, if R1 corresponds to addition in our universe, then we'd probably prefer to write it like I've shown on the right-hand side. But from a syntactic perspective, we can just write it the way I've shown on the left-hand side, and that's good enough. Now, given that we've got relation symbols and our logical uh, and, and our other symbols, um, we can now say what is a syntactically correct formula. So here, a formula is either an atomic formula or a compound formula made of other symbols. If it's an atomic formula, then it better be a relation symbol and it better have the correct number of arguments. So it must be syntactically correct according to the arity of that symbol. Now if we've got other formulas that are smaller like F1 and F2, we can combine them to make uh, larger formulas using the logical connectives and the quantifiers. Remember this is and, or, implies, not, and here we have for all. The proper syntax is for all is followed by a single variable name and a bracket and then a, a smaller formula that presumably contains x and then a closing bracket. And likewise, the existential quantifier should be used syntactically correctly as shown here. We also allow parentheses so we can group things, so we can build our formulas with uh, proper grouping. And so this is a recursive definition of what it means to be a syntactically correct formula. There are some variations you see in different uh, presentations. Um, one that's that often occurs is the not symbol, which I've shown here, is often uh, represented with a tilde. The tilde is a valid ASCII character, whereas this symbol is not part of the ASCII character set and it's maybe less commonly used. Um, also, negation, logical negation is, is represented with a bar over the f uh, a smaller formula. And uh, the, the universal and the existential quantifiers are sometimes uh, used in this syntax instead uh, with a dot and maybe parentheses. The parentheses being optional and used if necessary to make the meaning clear. And so, in our logical formulas, we use parentheses as necessary to make uh, the formula unambiguous. And oftentimes we have, in addition, uh, rules of precedence. For example, conjunction binds more tightly than disjunction. So if you see a formula that contains both of these, then the assumption is that the conjunction is done first, the same way multiplication is done before addition unless there are parentheses to override that. So I'm not going to belabor the uh, point of syntax since we've talked in detail about context-free grammars and syntax. So we're just talking at this level about syntactically correct f logical formulas made of the symbols from the alphabet. And this is without any sort of meaning attached to them. So we can build a syntactically correct formula in isolation from any sort of meaning. 
only later do we come along and, and say what universe we're talking about and what is the model for that formula. How, does, how do the symbols that we've used in the formula relate to objects in the universe or relations in the universe? If a formula is syntactically correct, we call it a well-formed formula. And we'd like to take a sequence of symbols and check to see whether it is a well-formed formula in the first order predicate logic. Can we check if the string is a legal formula? Well, yes, this is a, a simple parsing problem. It's uh, decidable, it's easy, we can make a parser that will look at a particular sequence of symbols and tell whether the formula is well formed. Do we have a well formed formula? And this would make sure that the arities are correct on the relationship symbols. It would make sure that the parentheses are matched. It would make sure that uh, after every quantifier there's a variable and so on. Now there's one more issue we need to look at and that's the question of these variables. So look at this formula here. Uh, it's syntactically correct but there's something else going on here. Uh, we see for all x and then uh, well actually it's not syntactically correct. Uh, I need a closing bracket there. Okay, there we go. Um, and um, we see that these, let's assume that these relation symbols are used with the proper arity, that they're both binary relations. I want to look at the variables here. We have variables x, y, and z, and x is quantified. So within this formula, between the brackets, x is bound. In other words, x is quantified. So x is okay, in a sense. We know what we mean by this variable x. We mean that uh, this state statement is true of all x's in our universe. Whatever our universe turns out to be, we're making a statement about all x's in the universe. We could also, if we had had an existential quantifier, we could say there exists some x that makes the statement true. But the other variables are not bound, and we say that they are free. Okay, they're unbound or free. So y and z are not quantified. And so we have a question as to what exactly y and z stand for. Okay, so now we can define what it means to be a statement. Okay, a statement is a formula with no free variables. So it has to be syntactically correct, but beyond that, we don't allow things like this where we have free variables like y and z. So a statement is a syntactically correct formula with no free variables. In other words, all the variables are quantified. So this is a valid statement. Okay, For all x there exists a y such that the relationship R holds between x and y. On the other hand, this one is not a valid statement because y occurs freely without being bound. So we can ask whether this statement is true or not, but this statement is not, um, this is not really a statement, so uh, to ask whether it's true or false is not, is not possible.